Lewis structures help us to anticipate the way that molecules will bond and how their electrons will be distributed by applying the octet rule. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a minimum energy configuration for where the electrons go. Same thing with formal charge, that also helps us to get a nice minimum energy. And molecules, they like to be in their lowest energy state. That's generally the most stable. So being able to anticipate that allowed us to anticipate what the molecule would look like in terms of connections. The molecules also have shape. They occupy a position in space, and depending on which shape they have, some of those shapes are gonna be higher energy or lower energy. So again, if we can predict which shapes are the lowest energy, then we can predict what our molecule is going to look like. And our tool to do this is called VESPER, the Valent Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. And it seems like quite a mouthful, but it's actually almost nothing new. Valent shell electrons, those are just the electrons we deal with in our Lewis structures, and we put them in pairs. The only thing that's new here is we're considering the fact that they repel each other. And the reason they strongly repel each other is because of the Pauli exclusion principle which says that we can never have more than two electrons occupying the same space. And that's a much stronger effect than the simple electric repulsion between like charges. So what will happen is that these electron pairs will try to orient themselves to provide the most room. And the atoms, consequently, will also be arranged in a way that, that helps to, to maximize the space between those electron pairs. So if we could just figure out how to space out those electron pairs, we can figure out what our molecules are going to look like. Let's say we want to find the three-dimensional structure of CH4, methane. Well, first of all, we can go ahead and figure out what the Lewis structure is. That will tell us which pairs of electrons we have to deal with. Now there's going to be eight electrons from the carbon and the four hydrogens. They form four bonds. And if we were limited to two dimensions, this right here would already be the optimum geometry because there's 90 degrees of space between all of these. And if I shift any of these to the left or the right, that's going to reduce it to less than 90 degrees on at least one side. But in actuality, molecules occupy three dimensions. And that third dimension is going to allow us to have even more than 90 degrees of space. So this is not going to be the, the best structure in three dimensions. What is going to be the best structure is kind of hard to anticipate, surprisingly hard to think in three dimensions, despite the fact that we're accustomed to our, our world being three dimensions. We make our maps in two dimensions and our papers in two dimensions and everything we deal with is usually simplified to two dimensions. Well, a very sophisticated instrument for predicting what the maximum spacing would be in three dimensions is a bunch of balloons. So here I've taken some balloons and I have just taped them together. And just like electrons, balloons cannot occupy the same space. Actually, that's because of their electrons. And just like our electrons, they are affixed to some central point like the, the nucleus. So they, they maximize their space around the nucleus and we get this shape here. Now our orbitals, for our electrons are going to do the exact same thing. They're also going to want to maximize the amount of space available. And if there's four lobes for our electrons, just like for our balloons, then we'll get an identical shape. It's called a tetrahedral shape. And so this is what the hydrogens will look like spaced around that carbon atom. Now in order to communicate that three-dimensional information in two dimensions, we're going to use a, a special notation. So if we have a bond which is coming out of the page, we are going to draw that with this kind of filled wedge. And if we have a bond which is going into the page, we're gonna draw it with a dashed wedge. And that's gonna allow us to depict all three dimensions, even though we only have a two dimensional paper probably that we're working with. Now for our methane molecule here, if we were to connect all the corners, we would get this shape which is a tetrahedron. And so we say that our methane has a tetrahedral geometry. Now, in theory, we can use our balloons to solve all of our Vesper problems. But in actuality, we probably don't want to have to replicate all of our molecules using balloons. 
So instead, we're going to assume someone's already done that for us, and we're just going to look up the information. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the AX method. So the AX method represents the significant features of our structure. A stands for the central atom. X stands for the number of atoms which are bonded to that atom. And E stands for the number of lone pair electrons on that atom. And once we know these numbers, we can just look them up in our chart. And one of the things we're going to look up is going to be the electron geometry. So that's where we've been considering, where we look at the pairs of electrons. We might also be interested in the molecular geometry. And this is where we are just looking at the shape of how the atoms are arranged. Even though the electrons are what dictate the overall shape, for the molecular geometry, we're going to ignore their existence once the shape is determined, and just look at how the atoms themselves are arranged. And we're going to define what's called a steric number. This is the total number of the attached domain. So it's the number of lone pairs of electrons that we have to worry about, plus the number of bonds that we have to worry about. And we consider double bonds or triple bonds to just count as one. Let's see if we can figure out the molecular geometry of sulfite. So we'll start by coming up with the Lewis structure. If we do that, we get this geometry. And if we work out the formal charges, we realize there should be one double bond here. But for our geometry, we're just going to count up one, two, three atoms and one electron pair on that sulfur. So that's going to give us a steric number of four from the three atoms attached and the one pair of electron attached. And so we would look in our chart over where we have four domains, and there's going to be four options. Now the electron geometry is the same for all four options, because these are four electron domains. So in general, these are all tetrahedral. But since in our case, we only have three atoms, then we're going to have this AX3 E1, where one of those electron domains is just the lone pair. And so the electron geometry is tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. So these are our two pictures here. Here's the geometry for the three atoms plus the pair of electrons. And here's the geometry for just the, the three atoms and then the central atom. And our Vesper chart will give us other useful information, things like the hybridization of the orbitals or the bond angles. So we know that these bond angles here should be 109.5 or fairly close to it. And we're going to see some reasons why this might deviate from being exactly 109.5. Further refinement we can make to our picture is to realize that not all electron domains are created equal. For instance, lone pair electrons occupy the most space. The reason they do is because you can think of these nuclei as sucking the electrons toward them. Well, if you only have one nucleus that you neighbor, then you have more freedom to disperse away from it and occupy more space. So, the, the orbital will be larger for a lone pair than for a bonding pair. Now for our bonding pairs, if we have twice as many electrons, we're going to need a little bit more space to accommodate them. If we have three times as many electrons, we're going to need a little bit more space to accommodate them. And so a double bond with four electrons is going to occupy more space than a single bond with two, etc. And the most will be occupied by our lone pair electrons. So if we have something like formaldehyde, normally, ideally, we would have 120 degree bond angles between everything. But since we have a double bond here, that has a little bit of extra repulsion to it. And so it's going to get a little bit more berth, 124.3 degrees. And these single bonds are going to be pushed together and only have 111.4 degrees of space. As an example, let's say that we wanted to do something like rank methane, ammonia, and water 
by the interior angle of their hydrogen bonds. So we could draw the Lewis structures for these and look up what their 3D structure would be in the Vesper chart. Now according to our Vesper chart, these all are going to have tetrahedral electron geometry. So they would all have 109.5 degrees of space. Now we realize that because of the existence of this lone pair of electrons, which pushes a little bit more than the bonding pairs do, that ammonia is going to have reduced bond angles down here. Now water, which has two pairs of electrons, is going to have twice the effect. So the, the bond angle is going to be even more contracted. And so we would rank these as water having the smallest bond angle followed by ammonia. And then methane has the largest bond angle. It has the perfect spacing of 109.5 degrees. Among the major benefits of knowing the geometry of the molecule is that we can say something about the polarity of the molecule. And we can assign molecules a net dipole, which is basically the sum of all the bond dipoles added together. Now in order to add these bond dipoles together, an easy way to visualize it is you just draw them in a path. So for example, if we have this water molecule of two dipoles, take one of those dipoles and draw the vector, then take the next dipole and draw the vector where you left off and finish it out. And if you do this for all the vectors, you'll get a path. And uh, the start of the path drawn to the end of the path gives you the overall vector for the molecule, the net dipole of the molecule. So what we have here is we have two dipoles pointing down. One is pointing left, one is pointing right. And the left and right parts cancel each other out, but the two downward parts add together. And that gives us a, a net downward arrow. So this is our net dipole for our water molecule. And we can do this for other molecules. An example of a polar molecule would be something like carbon monoxide. We have a polar bond between the oxygen and the carbon, and that accounts for the entire dipole moment of the molecule. Now if we have something like carbon dioxide though, we'll have two polar bonds but they will cancel out altogether. You think of this as two people pushing in with equal force on some central object, the object's not going to move. Now we can have more complex shapes. Here we have boron trifluoride. It might be a little bit hard to figure out whether all these dipoles cancel. Now you can do like before, you can draw them out in a path, and here you'll see that this is a, a closed path. You wind up back where you started. So that tells us that there's no net dipole for this molecule. The, the pattern here, the secret though, is really seeing that there's a symmetry on these molecules. Now if there's a symmetry between this side and this side, what that means is there couldn't possibly be a dipole pointing to this oxygen or a dipole pointing to this oxygen because they're equivalent. Same thing with more complex symmetries. If you told me that you had a dipole pointing out right here, well, what I would do is I would take this molecule and I would shuffle it behind my back and I would ask you where it was that you had indicated that dipole. You wouldn't be able to tell me because it looks the same in all three ways. And so that refutes the idea that there could be a dipole pointing this way. Of course, it gets even more complicated once we're in three dimensions. So again, if we recognize symmetry, like here with this carbon tetrafluoride, 109 degree bond angles between all of these fluorines, and they're all equivalent. If I shuffle this behind my back, you can't tell me, having picked a fluorine, you know, what it is after, which one fluorine is yours after I show it to you. But if we break this symmetry, if we take off one of these fluorines and replace it with a different atom, well now I have three vectors which are symmetrical about this axis. They all point in towards this axis, but they also all three point up. And so the upward components will add together 
and give me an overall upward pointing dipole for this molecule.